Hello. In this brief talk, I'd like to outline the history of assessment and just summarise what it is that I think that every teacher needs to know about assessment. It may seem the driest of all possible topics, but actually assessment is at the heart of effective teaching because it is only through assessment that we can find out whether what we did with our students resulted in the learning that we hoped for. Assessment is the bridge between teaching and learning. Originally, assessment was thought of very much as a kind of stock taking. We actually taught students stuff and then we just take stock of what the students have learned. So it was like a kind of inventory process of education. And to begin with, we would talk about the validity of a test, whether it measured what we really thought it was measuring as a property of the test. We would say that some tests are valid and other tests are not valid. The problem is that that very quickly became untenable because the same test might be valid for one group of students and not for another group of students. Let's say you've got a mathematics test with a high reading demand. Now, if you're giving it to students who are good readers, then high scores usually indicate good maths knowledge and low scores indicate poor maths knowledge. But if you give it to a group of students who aren't very good at reading, you don't know how to interpret low scores. It could be that they didn't actually understand the question well enough to be able to do the mathematics. They might be able to do the mathematics, but they didn't understand what they were being asked to do because they couldn't read the question. So high scores mean Yes, they can do the maths and they can do the reading, but low scores are impossible to interpret. You don't know what those scores mean. And very quickly we realised that, uh, as researchers in this area, that really there is no such thing as a valid test. Validity is a property of the conclusions you draw from a test, not the test itself. There is no such thing as a valid test. And that's a really important point. If you ask people, you know, is this test valid? That's not a very smart thing to ask because it can be valid for some purposes and not for others. A consequence of this is there's no such thing as a biased test. Bias is not in the test itself. It is in the conclusions we draw. Let's take an example from psychology. There is a thing that psychologists have, dis have discussed and studied in great detail, which is the mental rotation of three-dimensional solids. The idea is we give people a picture of a solid object and we give four or five examples of things that may or may not be that same object from a different perspective. And we ask people which one of these five is the same shape in a different orientation. And it's called mental rotation of 3D solids because we're pretty sure that the way that people solve these puzzles or problems is by mentally rotating these shapes in their head. We know that people take longer to solve them if you need to mentally rotate the shape by more degrees to get it to match the one that you're looking at. Now this is a very interesting psychological task because men are much better than women. The male-female gap in this particular skill is one of the largest gaps that we've ever come across in psychology, typically well over a standard deviation. That means that only typically about one in every six females is as good as the average male at this task. This leads some people to conclude that this is a biased test, but it's not, because males really are better than females at this task in most cultures. The bias comes when we would use such a test, for example, to decide that some people could be better mathematicians than others. There is no evidence that males are better mathematicians than females, so it would be a biased inference. The test is not biased because a test tests just what a test tests. The bias creeps in when we actually give that test result a particular meaning. And so the biggest shift that's happened in the history of assessment, I think, is this shift from thinking about tests uh, as just neutral instruments to thinking about what kinds of inferences we draw on the basis of test results. So basically, an assessment is just a procedure for drawing inferences. We give students things to do, they produce evidence that we interpret to draw conclusions. And that is also, by the way, a very uh, a neat, I think, way of thinking about formative and summative uh, aspects of assessment. There's no such thing as a formative test or a summative assessment, because they are uses to which the information from the assessment is put. Let me give you an example. Let's say I test a group of students on their, seven to, uh, on their times tables, and I see that this student has got 80% right. 
So I can conclude, within certain limitations, that he probably knows 80% of his number bonds. But if I can see that the ones he got wrong were almost exclusively in the seven times table, that tells me what to do next with that student. So the same test, number facts, the same test data, the child scores on those tests, can support a summative conclusion, this child knows 80% of his number bonds, or a formative conclusion, I need to work with this child on their seven times table. So I think that's the really important conclusion here, that we have to start thinking about assessments not in terms of the assessments themselves, but the kind of conclusions they let us draw. Now there are two kinds of things that can go wrong with our conclusions. And these two things that can go wrong have got really quite complicated jargon involved in, in the description. And some people don't like this jargon, but I think it's worth engaging with this jargon because once you get your head around these ideas, they're extremely powerful. So the first one is construct under representation. The construct is what we're trying to measure. So if we call something a test of mathematics achievement, mathematics achievement is the thing we're measuring. Science achievement. We test that very often with just written tests. Now, if your view of science education includes the importance of being able to do practical work, your assessment underrepresents the construct because you're only testing the kinds of things that you can test with a written test. And it's quite interesting to notice that in mathematics and in English and science, we systematically underrepresent certain aspects of those subjects in the way that we assess them. We don't assess students' ability to speak or to listen when we test them in English, at least at the national curriculum level. We don't assess using and applying mathematics, we tend to test the things that are easy to test. And the same in science, we're now trying to get rid of practical assessments in science because it's too troublesome to assess them. And that's a good example of construct under-representation. The assessment is too small. It fails to assess things it should have assessed. The opposite problem happens when the assessment is too big. And this goes by the rather fearsome name of construct irrelevant variance. And it's quite a straightforward term once you understand where it comes from. As I said earlier, a construct is just what it is that we're trying to assess. So let's say we have an arithmetic test, but the construct we're trying to assess is arithmetic. What we want is for students' scores to represent their ability in this particular area. So we want high scores to represent high arithmetic achievement, and we want low scores to represent low arithmetic achievement. We want the variance or the variation in scores to be relevant to the thing that we're measuring. But if the low scores are sometimes caused by poor reading, then some of the variation in student scores is caused by differences in, in, in arithmetic ability, but some of the variation in scores is caused by differences in reading ability. And that is irrelevant to the thing that we think we are meant to be assessing, which is arithmetic achievement. So this assessment, with a high reading demand, the scores would be said to suffer from construct irrelevant variance. Some of the variation in the scores is relevant to the thing we want to look at, arithmetic achievement. Some of the variation in scores is actually irrelevant to that because it's reading achievement. And that's a systematic difference. All poor readers will do worse. There's also a random component of construct irrelevant variance. For example, if a teacher tells you that you're going to get a spelling test of 100 words tomorrow. They tell you which 100 words, but they only sample 10 of them in the test. Then if you happen to, by chance, have studied those 10 words, you'll do better than if you had not studied those particular 10 words. And so any assessment has a random component. The question is, did the questions that come up suit you? Were you lucky? Now these two ideas, construct and representation, and construct irrelevant variance, help highlight another important issue in assessment, which is the source of disagreements or debates about assessment. So one thing I often ask people is, can you assess history, historical thinking, with multiple choice tests? Some people think yes, some people think no. And you can get very heated debates about whether you can or cannot reasonably or validly assess historical thinking with a multiple choice test. The important point here is that when these people have these debates, which can become very acrimonious, 
They think they're having a debate about assessment, but they're really not. What they're doing is they are discussing, they are disagreeing about what it is that we think history is about. They are disagreeing about the construct, not about the assessment. If you think history is all about facts and dates, then you think multiple choice tests are pretty nifty because you can test an awful lot of facts and dates quite quickly. And in fact, you think that essay questions are bad because you're testing students' handwriting skills. You think that essay assessments of history embody construct irrelevant variants because you're testing students' writing skills and handwriting speed. Conversely, there are some people who think, perhaps the majority of history teachers, think that history is about more than just facts and dates. It's also about narrative, it's about cause and effect, it's about chronology. And for those people, multiple choice tests underrepresent the construct of history. The important point I want to draw to your attention is that the debate surfaces when people say this is a good assessment or this is a bad assessment of historical thinking. They think they're arguing about the assessment, but they're not. They're arguing about the construct. They're arguing about what it is that historical thinking is all about. And that's why assessments are so valuable because assessments operationalize constructs. Assessments force us to get off the fence and say, this is what I mean by historical thinking. If a student can do this, they are good at historical thinking. And that's why so many debates are so heated, but the real debate is about the construct, not the assessment. Once you have clear ideas about what it is that you think historical thinking is all about, coming up with an assessment is a relatively technical matter. People shouldn't agree about, uh, disagree, sorry. People shouldn't disagree about whether this is a good or a bad assessment. It should be a pretty technical issue. Now, the random component of construct irrelevant variance is usually called reliability or unreliability. And this is a really important issue, particularly with regard to school assessment. Because if we give students a history exam, for example, typically we might ask them to answer five questions. And a considerable source of error in the scores of just random variation is whether that student happened to have studied those particular topics the day before. So we want differences in students' scores on a history exam to represent or reflect their ability to think historically. But if a substantial proportion of the variation in the scores is just how lucky they were, then those kinds of assessments can't support valid inferences about that student's historical thinking. And that's why reliability is so important. The reliability of school assessments is typically in the region of 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and that's a technical way of talking about it. The important point is, if a student gets a score of 70, then what you're really saying is you've got 70, plus or minus 10, maybe even 15. Your score is somewhere between 65 and 85. Now, many people are appalled by that, but that's just the way things are. Our assessments aren't perfectly reliable. People say, why can't we make our assessments more reliable? We can. We can make our assessments as reliable as we want, provided we're willing to spend more time testing. But I think we've got more important things to do, like teaching. So the crucial thing to, to realize is that the unreliability of our assessments is a good thing. It means we're not spending too much time spending on, kids, on giving kids tests. We are instead focusing most of our time on teaching and occasionally we assess and we find out whether the assessments whether the, reflect the student's ability within the limitations of the reliability. So the point is we will never know for certain whether that student has or has not mastered something because this, the assessment has a degree of unreliability and that's a good thing because it means we're not spending too much time testing. But there's one consequence of this that people don't appreciate, particularly in schools where they track students' progress. And that is that change scores are particularly unreliable. So if a student is given a test and gets a score of 50, and then six weeks later gets given a similar test, a parallel test, and gets a score of 70, we think that student has made good progress. We might tell the parents, write a letter home, saying what a great amount of progress this student has made. And they may well have been indeed have done so. The most likely thing is that those students have made that progress. But don't forget that 50 could have really been a 60 and the student got a lower score than they really deserved because of the unreliability of the test. And that 70 could have really been a 60 because that student on the second test 
got lucky and I had a test that really suited their particular strengths in this subject. So it could be that that student has made no progress at all. Their true score was 60 on the first occasion and 60 on the second occasion, but they appear to make great progress because they were unlucky the first time they were tested and they were lucky the second time they were tested. Change scores are inherently unreliable and typically the error of measurement is about the typical progress a child makes in six months. So change scores are very difficult to use well. At a group level, they cancel out. For every student who gets a score higher than they should have got, there's another student who gets a score lower than they should have got. So they can be quite good guides to the progress made by a group of students. But at the level of the individual, they are highly unreliable. The biggest takeaway here is you should know, at least to some reasonable estimate, how reliable your assessments are. If you don't know the error of measurement of the scores that you're giving your students, I don't think you should be giving scores to students or to parents. We need to understand how to estimate standard errors of measurement, very straightforward with Excel these days, but some indication of the fact that every score, every grade we give to students is actually an unreliable guide to their true achievement. It, that's essential that we appreciate that because then we won't over-interpret our assessments. Putting all these things together, I think the best schools have assessment systems that are planned as assessment systems. So teachers need to make decisions on the fly, minute by minute and day by day. Schools need to check that teachers uh, are making the right kind of progress with their students. They need to monitor achievement over time. Parents need reports periodically. Students need to know where they are. So everybody needs assessment information. But the important thing to do is to make sure that these kinds of uses of assessment information don't interfere with each other. So there was a classic example in the old national curriculum where students were given national curriculum levels. And many schools had a policy that students could not go down a level. Now this is actually crazy because students are very varied in their performance. Um, one study that we did with the Leverhulme uh, uh, Foundation a few years ago found that over the four years of, of junior schooling, 90% uh, of students had a, a setback of at least six months, at least once in their junior school career. They went back by six months. In other words, after six months, they were actually scoring at a lower level than they had been six months earlier. Going forwards, going backwards, these are natural parts of the kind of messy progress that students make. But many schools said you can't have that. We have to have this kind of ratchet where if a student is a level five, they must be at least a level 5.5 in a year's time or whatever. And that's absolutely crazy. It doesn't take into account the unreliability of the assessment and it ends up making school records completely meaningless for supporting learning. So the important thing to appreciate is that any use of an assessment or its outcomes impacts on other uses you can make and that may mean we need to have self-denying ordinances that we're not going to use these assessments for this purpose because we're using them for a different purpose. But I think the really most important thing for teachers and for schools to appreciate is the idea that we must move away from data-driven decision-making. Data-driven decision-making sounds great. It sounds like we're using data, we're being scientific. But the problem is that people who espouse data-driven decision-making hoard data. You can tell that because they keep their data in data warehouses. They love data. They can't get enough of it. The problem is they don't have very much information because they collected that data without a very clear idea of what they were going to do with it. So I think we need a new paradigm. I think we need to shift from data-driven decision-making to decision-driven data collection. Let me give you an example. I was with a science teacher a while back, a year eight science class. The teacher asked the students in the last five minutes of the lesson to explain the difference between mass and weight on little index cards. She calls them exit passes. As the students left, they had to hand in their cards at the end of the lesson, and the teacher read through them, and she put them in the bin. I was surprised. I asked the teacher, why did you put them in the bin? She says, I know where to start tomorrow's lesson. I said, what did you learn? She said, they all got it, I'm moving on. I said to her, what would you have done if they all got it wrong? She said, I'd have taught it again, but slower and louder. <laughs>
she said, that's a joke. I'd have taught it again in a different way. I said, okay, okay, thanks. What would you have done if half the students answered correctly and half the students answered incorrectly? Ah, oh, she said, I'd have kept two of the cards, labelled one as A, one as B, put them on the visualiser at the beginning of the next lesson and ask the students to vote for one or the other and then take the discussion from there, which I thought was quite smart. I said to her, why didn't you give individual feedback to the students? She said, I couldn't. Really? Why not? They didn't write their names on the cards. Why not? Why didn't you get them to write their names on the cards? She said, that'd be really stupid. If I wanted to give individual feedback to the students, I would get them to write their answers in their notebooks, which already have their names written on them. And then it really struck me. What that teacher did was very smart. It was a good example of decision-driven data collection, because that teacher was collecting the smallest amount of information that she could think of to make the decision that she needed to make, where do I start tomorrow's lesson, in the smartest way possible. And that, I think, is the overarching idea here, that assessments are simply procedures for drawing inferences. The idea is we collect the evidence that we need to support those inferences, but we decide in advance what we need to know and then collect only enough information to make those decisions in a better way. If you don't know why you're recording this information, it's probably not a good idea to record it in the first place. In the first place. Finally, as long as we hang on to this idea that assessments are simply procedures for drawing